Hello, I'm Eric Strong, a hospitalist and clinical associate professor at Stanford University. In today's episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing preoperative evaluation. Pre-op evals are a relatively common reason for inpatient consultation, but how to conduct one is not usually taught in medical school. Perioperative medicine as a whole is an enormous subject. It's an entire field of its own to which people devote their entire careers. This video is obviously not going to touch on all potential perioperative issues, but instead will focus on what to do as an inpatient medicine consultant in response to a request from a surgeon for a pre-op eval. This discussion will not cover considerations that are specific for anesthesiologists. It also doesn't completely apply to evaluation before cardiac or lung surgery or surgery in pregnant women, as those have additional considerations that warrant consultation with additional specialists. As an internist, their first step to conducting a typical pre-op eval is to understand what question is being asked of you. For example, the surgeon may be asking, what is the patient's perioperative risk? In other words, the surgeon and patient have not yet decided whether to proceed with surgery, and they will be using your risk assessment in that decision. Or alternatively, the surgeon may be asking, how can we minimize the patient's perioperative risk? Implying that the decision to proceed with surgery has already been made. Certainly, there are consults for pre-op evals that include both of these questions, but it is helpful to best tailor the consult and recommendations if you can clarify with the surgeon whether or not your assessment will impact the decision to proceed with the proposed procedure at all. When we are talking about surgical risk, what exactly are we talking about? Risk of what? In my experience, to most laypersons, that term surgical risk implies risk of something catastrophic happening in the OR itself, on the operating table. However, for most patients and for most surgeries, the procedure itself goes fine. It's very rare for even elderly, chronically ill patients to literally die on the table during a non-emergent surgery. Instead, the complications typically come afterwards. Occasionally, this happens in the PACU or the recovery room, but more often, the complications show up in the days or even weeks after the actual surgery. So what are these complications? The ones that are most concerning to everyone are major cardiac events, myocardial infarctions, and cardiac arrest. Often, concern about cardiac complications is so great relative to everything else that sometimes the term pre-op eval is used synonymously with pre-op cardiac eval. But that is a significant oversight because there are plenty of other adverse outcomes and potential complications to worry about. Other risks from surgery include bleeding complications that might require returning to the OR, pneumonia, venous thromboembolism, delirium, a more chronic form of altered mentation called post-operative cognitive dysfunction, poor wound healing and surgical site infections, dysregulation of glycemic control, including the triggering of diabetic ketoacidosis, and drug and alcohol withdrawal in patients who abruptly cease the use of a substance upon admission to the hospital for surgery. Surgery has the potential to trigger each of these, and the risk for each don't always parallel one another in a particular patient. For example, some patients will be at a relatively high risk of developing pneumonia, while others might be at a relatively high risk of delirium. While we often focus on quantifying cardiac risk and then offering a more subjective assessment of everything else in the list, there are objective risk models and clinical prediction tools to predict risk from some of these other complications. What factors play into the risk to the patient from surgery? There are five general categories of factors. First is the patient's medical history. This obviously includes major medical problems such as heart failure, diabetes, and kidney disease, but it also includes their nutritional status and includes age and the presence of obesity, though these last two play a smaller role than you might guess. Second is the patient's baseline exercise capacity. The most common way this is assessed is an estimate of the maximum METs or metabolic equivalents a patient is able to do in a typical day. 
One met is achieved by sitting and reading or watching television. Ten mets would be met by an intensive competitive sport, such as soccer or basketball. In pre-op assessments, a rough cutoff of four mets, walking up a single flight of stairs at a regular pace, is sometimes used to differentiate high versus low functional status, which is thought to increase or decrease surgical risk. Now, some research has found that the estimation of exercise capacity by using METs is not well predictive of surgical risk, but nevertheless, it's still incorporated into official guidelines from professional societies, such as the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. Some clinicians feel that the more comprehensive Duke Activity Status Index provides an overall better assessment of this. Another category contributing to risk is the patient's current stability. For example, is the patient currently hemodynamically stable without the need for any inpatient-specific therapies? Are they relatively stable but only with IV fluid support or with the use of intravenous vasoactive medications? Or are they unstable in septic shock? The American Society of Anesthesiologists combined multiple factors from these first three categories into a five-tier classification system ranging from ASA Class 1 for a normal healthy patient to ASA Class 5 for more moribund patient not expected to survive without the operation. The last two categories are related to the surgery. There is the specific type of surgery. Obviously, some procedures carry higher risk than others. Procedural risk is dependent on the type of anesthesia required, the duration of the procedure, how technically difficult the procedure is, and the typical volume of blood loss. Different references include modest variations in how different procedures are classified by risk, but here is a typical breakdown. The lowest risk category includes procedures that don't require general anesthesia, and many which are short, laparoscopic procedures, while the highest risk category includes heart, lung, aortic, and most transplant surgeries. And last is the acuity of surgery. This is relevant because high acuity suggests the patient is less stable and that there will be less time to evaluate and medically optimize the patient before the procedure. High acuity procedures are more likely to be performed on a weekend or at night when there is less staff present in the event of an acute complication. And to be honest, they are less likely to be performed by a surgeon whose specific area of primary expertise is the relevant organ disease process or procedure. The acuity of surgery can be classified as emergent if life or limb are threatened without intervention within six hours, such as a ruptured aortic aneurysm or resection of infarcted bowel. Urgent if life or limb is threatened without intervention within 24 hours, such as a heart valve replacement in a patient with medically refractory endocarditis. Time sensitive if the procedure is medically necessary within one to six weeks such as the resection of a tumor, or elective if it could be safely deferred for up to one year, as would be the case with typical joint replacements or cataract surgery. In addition to conducting a history and physical exam for the patient, focusing on what's relevant for understanding the severity of any of the patient's chronic medical problems, a big consideration is what preoperative tests, if any, should be obtained. As a very general rule, Physicians overorder tests as part of the pre-op eval. We succumb to a bias that more data is always better, when in reality, ordering tests to screen for diseases in healthy appearing and healthy feeling individuals is not cost effective and runs the risk of unnecessarily delaying the procedure after you become ob obligated to investigate some unrelated incidental finding. So in what circumstance is any given test indicated? There are mild differences of opinion between different professional societies, but here is a general summary. Starting with preoperative blood tests, hemoglobin and hematocrit are indicated in patients with a history of anemia and prior to any surgery that's expected to have a relatively high blood loss. Platelet count is indicated in patients with a history of chronic liver disease, history of thrombocytopenia, and those who report a history of significant bleeding symptoms who have not undergone a prior workup for that. A basic metabolic panel, which includes electrolytes and creatinine, is indicated in patients with known chronic kidney disease who are on meds, which could affect electrolytes, 
and possibly in elderly patients. Liver function tests in patients with symptomatic chronic liver disease, a hemoglobin A1c to screen for diabetes if it's indicated anyway as part of routine healthcare maintenance, coagulation tests, meaning an INR and PTT, in patients with known coagulopathies or in patients with a history of bleeding symptoms and no prior workup. Other tests include urinalysis for patients undergoing urologic or gynecologic surgery as asymptomatic bacteriuria is typically treated preoperatively in these patients. A pregnancy screen is indicated for any woman of childbearing age. A urine tox screen in patients with a history of drug use. I want to emphasize that a positive urine drug screen should not be used to punitively delay or cancel surgery in patients who are using drugs. The point of the drug screen is to be able to counsel the patient to abstain from drugs of abuse prior to surgery for long enough that there won't be any intraoperative hemodynamic problems and to be prepared for the possibility of withdrawal occurring after the procedure. An ECG is indicated in patients with either a history of coronary artery disease, heart failure, or arrhythmias, and if the surgery is also medium to high risk. The point of this is for the patient to have an immediately pre-op baseline ECG for comparison in the event of an intraoperative or postoperative cardiac event. An ECG is debatably indicated in patients with multiple cardiovascular risk factors as a screen for CAD, as the presence of CAD is a negative prognostic marker for postoperative complications. A chest X-ray should be obtained for patients with a history of cardiac or pulmonary disease who are undergoing thoracic or upper abdominal surgery. And an echocardiogram, often ordered for anyone with a history of cardiovascular problems, is actually best probably reserved for two specific groups of patients. First, those with known or suspected moderate to severe aortic or mitral stenosis. And second are those patients with evidence of heart failure on the history and exam, but who lack a diagnosis of such, since the presence or absence of heart failure will impact the perioperative risk assessment. Although cardiac risk is just one component of the preoperative evaluation, I will spend just a few extra minutes on it because it's usually the most important component. In the U.S., there are three models or tools used to predict perioperative cardiac risk. Anecdotally, the most common is called the Revised Cardiac Risk Index, sometimes referred to as the Lee Index. Another is the MICA calculator, also known as the GUPTA score. MICA is an acronym that stands for Myocardial Infarction or Cardiac Arrest. And the last is the American College of Surgeons Surgical Risk Calculator. All of these are validated clinical prediction tools that incorporate variables about the patient and planned procedure to determine the percentage risk of a major cardiac event over some period of time following surgery. In terms of the specific variables they incorporate, the RCRI uses a history of coronary artery disease, heart failure, stroke or TIA, insulin requiring diabetes, creatinine, and a dichotomous assignment of the specific procedure to high versus low risk. A less common but possibly better performing version of the RCRI does not include diabetes as a consideration, and instead of using serum creatinine as a marker for renal insufficiency, uses GFR. Meanwhile, the MICA incorporates age, the patient's functional status, their ASA class, creatinine, and a much more granular assessment of the type of surgery. The ACS-SRC is a more complex tool that incorporates 22 different variables, including the precise surgical procedure. When using the convenient online calculator, it provides this easy-to-read graph that displays not just the risk of a cardiac complication, but also risk of postoperative pneumonia, surgical site infection, venous thromboembolism, readmission, return to OR, and the discharge to a skilled nursing facility, and the overall predicted length of hospital stay. This seems like an amazing tool, but to be honest, I am not personally convinced that it is sufficiently accurate for routine use, particularly with unusually high-risk situations. For example, the scenario that is currently shown on the screen is that of an 80-year-old man, partially dependent for his ADLs, with a history of hypertension, COPD, and insulin-requiring diabetes, who presented with sepsis complicated by dialysis requiring acute kidney injury, now in need of emergent cholecystectomy. 
and it gives a 30-day risk of death of 15%, discharge to sniff probability of 56%, and predicted hospital length of stay of 7 days, all of which are, in my humble opinion, significant underestimates. In short, these three tools should be used as guides, but they should not supersede clinical judgment. There will always be relatively unique factors that the models don't include, which could give a patient a higher or lower risk from surgery, including their preoperative stability. A question that often comes up with pre-surgical cardiac risk assessment is whether or not pre-op cardiac stress testing should be undertaken. In the past, this was relatively commonplace, but not so much anymore. As a general rule, preoperative cardiac stress testing prior to non-cardiac surgery should not be performed on most patients unless there is another indication. Why is that? Simply put, expert consensus backed by evidence shows that revascularization prior to surgery does not improve surgical outcomes. Now, as implied by the caveat on most patients, there are some possible exceptions to this. For example, in higher-risk patients undergoing relatively high-risk surgery, in whom the presence of ischemic heart disease might influence the decision to undergo surgery at all. Despite the aforementioned limitations of using estimated METs as a marker of exercise capacity and preoperative risk, the most recent joint ACC and AHA guidelines recommend pharmacologic stress testing in patients whose estimated max METs is under 4 or is unknown. But even then, it's primarily to help make a decision about surgery. It's usually not because the patient needs a pre-op trip to the cath lab for angioplasty. As mentioned at the beginning, the pre-op eval is not just to determine the patient's surgical risk, it's also to provide advice about how to minimize the risk of specific complications. So when providing recommendations to the primary service, be sure to include specific recommendations on preventing pneumonia, delirium, post-op swings in blood pressure, hyperglycemia, etc., but preferably recs that are specific to the patient. Now keep in mind, the surgeon who consulted you has operated on thousands of patients. They do not need you to remind them to order the incentive spirometer, but rather they're hoping for specific advice about this specific patient. Things like adjusting a poorly controlled diabetic patient's insulin regimen while NPO, or providing guidance on what they should do with a heart failure patient's diuretics immediately after surgery things that are individual to the specific patient. The last thing I'm going to discuss is when should surgery be temporarily delayed due to a currently unacceptably high perioperative risk. The short answer is not very often. It's much more common to take a surgical procedure out of consideration altogether than it is to delay it for medical optimization. This is because many of the patient-specific risk factors for surgical complications are either non-modifiable or take an unacceptably long time to do so. When delaying surgery to provide time to modify risk factors, common reasons for it include optimizing volume status in patients with heart failure, improving blood pressure in patients with uncontrolled hypertension, improving rate control in patients with atrial fibrillation, waiting out a patient's syndrome of alcohol or drug intoxication or withdrawal, and to wait out the period of contagiousness in a patient with COVID. Delays in these circumstances are typically on the order of days to a week or two. Situations in which a longer delay may be appropriate is for weight loss in a morbidly obese patient prior to elective orthopedic surgery, or one to preferably two months of smoking cessation in patients with a high risk of perioperative pulmonary complications. In addition, experts recommend delaying elective surgeries for two months following a myocardial infarction. And for some patients with severe or critical aortic stenosis, valve repair prior to their other procedure may be the safest approach. And of course, all of this depends on the urgency of the surgery. That concludes this video on preoperative evaluation as part of the intern crash course series. If you found it helpful, please be sure to like and share it and consider subscribing to Strong Medicine for more videos like this one on a wide variety of medical topics.